Good morning. Good morning. To the Saints at Adamport Baptist Church, it's so good to see you. And that is who you are, right? You are saints. We're not perfect. Only God is that, but uh, the one who makes us perfect. Um, oh, did you hear that Rudolph got four grades? He went down in history. Do you know what they call Santa, uh, somebody who's afraid of Santa Claus? Claustrophobic. <laughs> I just heard that yeah, this week. Those are the only times I remember them. You know. uh, so I thought they were good. So, we're sharing. Um, I think I got those from kids. <laughs> anyway, so good that you're here, here today in light of everything that's going on, right? This does not define who we are. Just remember, this does not define who we are. Uh, we are children of God, and uh, loved by Him, cared for Him, and uh, no matter what we're going through, uh, He wants with us as an awfully good shepherd. And I hold on to that, and uh, as we uh, celebrate our service this morning, just a couple of things. Uh, I need your help. And what I need you to do is the songs that we're singing today, we're going to be taping as part of the recording for the Christmas Eve service. That's why I dressed in my costume today, uh, just so I don't look like I'm out of place when we do this. And uh, also, uh, we are recording this on Friday, December the 18th. So uh, for all those who are participating or are going to be there that day, just to remind you of that. And also, the envelopes are available now at the back of the church when you leave to pick them up so you can have them. Is there any other announcements that we need to be aware of? Okay. Well, I don't get a card to be delivered. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you. There are cards at the back with uh, you know, people's names on them. Just a, a sign up list, a sign -up list and, and a card. So, if you could, for anyone who would like to deliver the card, uh, and I guess check with June or anybody who's responsible for kind of that. And June. And Debbie. And Debbie. Yes, she is. Okay. Yes. Oh, there you are. Yes. Yeah. Max, you are killing me. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to bring an update uh, on our chili supper. It was a great success. We made over $1,800, and by the time we took out expenses, we were able to send for over $1,400 to Canadian Baptist Ministries, which is us. This is what we support. Yeah. We are all over the world helping people. And so with the $1,400, is Beth here? Beth. Let's give Beth a round of applause. And Thank you for the help. That girl, all I did was mention, can we raise some money, Beth? And off she went. That was it. Next thing I know, she's got her, her team ready. She's got the licks flying. She's got chili going on. Amazing lady. Just amazing. Thank you, Beth, so much. You just did a super job. Okay, this is what we were able to buy with the 1400 textbooks for schools, uniforms, and you have to remember that in these countries, most of, most of underdeveloped countries, you can't go to school unless you have a uniform and your parents have to buy that. So most kids don't get to go to school. I thought that would be a great one. Seeds for growing vegetables and fruits, pigs, three little pigs. <laughs> we got a cow for $600 now. Tell me, farmers, would that buy a tail of a cow here? <laughs> I think that's about it. Uh, we were able to stock a medical clinic. Can you imagine a whole medical clinic and we stocked it? We had, uh, we bought goats, hens, and roosters. We had uh, set up a mom and baby care clinic. Uh, we uh, contributed to a clean water fund that would go towards drilling a well. 
which uh, we have tools for children with disabilities. This will be children that need wheelchairs, they need training, they need all the extra things that children with disabilities, just parents cannot afford that in those countries. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone that supported us. It was great. Thank you for at least uh, throwing that seed out, and uh, I just really appreciate everybody here, you know, people who have invited people to come and join us, uh, those of you who called to see if you could come and join us, we are so glad you're here, and uh, certainly pray uh, God's blessing on you this morning. As we begin our service, uh, it's the lighting of the third heaven candle.
great music, great comedy. Is there any one particular we need to be praying for today? As we yes. I have some very dear friends fighting cancer, so um, one is named John, and uh, he's in Fort St. John. Right. John. And Brad, who's a Berwick Clay, and he's from. What's his name again? Uh, John. 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 Is, John. Just is, call him John. Just and John. Brad Ray Hughes is fighting the cancer in um, Berwick. Okay. I'll be very grateful. Okay. Well, yet, yeah, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Shall we worship God? Father, how grateful we are that we can gather in this Advent season and as we continually are preparing our hearts as you come into this place this morning. We invite you and thank you for your presence and your spirit that is in us and working among us, speaking into each one's heart. We give you thanks and praise for the God you are, creator of heaven and earth, that you would so love this world that you would give your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us uh, in this season, and we thank you for your goodness to us in this past year, as challenging as it has been. We thank you for the care that you've given each one here. We thank you for the way that you have led us, your people. Father, we thank you for your provision uh, and your uh, your presence with us. Father, we want to thank you as well as we enter this Christmas season and uh, walk through it that in the, the, the preparation for uh, the Christmas day and, and having family and whatever that looks like uh, for each one of us, that you would be the God who uh, just continues to be a God of peace and joy and love and hope uh, at such a critical time as this. Father, I'm just reminded of thousands of years ago when uh, we read those verses of people walking in, in, uh, in the darkness of seeing a great light. And Father, you are truly the light of the world. Father, as we worship today, we bring before you um, the great opportunities that you've given us in in supplying the needs of those in third world countries uh, through this chilly supper and, and just hearing what Debbie had to say about the uh, what that money was able to do and encourages us. And I thank you that as we pay it forward, as we are offer our kindness, uh, that you would pour your blessing. And uh, Father, uh, small is huge when you are in it. And so thank you, Father, that even though we may be small in number, we are huge in spirit as you continue to lead and guide us in ministry. I thank you for all the opportunities that you give us as open doors to our families, to our friends and our community as uh, we proclaim good news. And I pray that you would be just simply preparing people's hearts, opening doors of opportunity that we might speak a word for you and people come to know Jesus this Christmas as Lord and Savior, the one who uh, forgives every sin and uh, uh, purifies us of all unrighteousness. Uh, Father, we think of uh, John and we think of Rob today, both fighting cancer, uh, and just pray for them today. Uh, and the full authority that you give us in Jesus' name, may you be the healer uh, in whatever area of their life that they need. Uh, may you be able to uh, bring life to them and comfort and hope. Father, in light of the COVID the pandemic and the, some of the closures that are taking place and some of the seniors that are being affected by that, I would like to pray for them. I think especially of my mom in Kings Riverside and uh, uh, how many will not be able to spend Christmas with their family uh, this season. And so I pray that you would be the God uh, who uh, ministers to them. Father, uh, despite all these things, we offer you our praise and our adoration to the God who you are, to the God who comes, and the God who is near. And we give you all the, again, the glory, the honor, and praise as we continue our worship, as we uh, prepare for Christmas Eve, and as we offer our prayer that Jesus taught his disciples long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be 
be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. a long time. Thanks to Fiona. Secretly sent two spies, not twelve, and in secret this time, 
uh, from Shittim, about seven miles from Jericho. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the women had taken the two men, the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. And thus, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of the flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gates were shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills to the pursuit, so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and they go on your way and then go on your way. Now the men he said to now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down, and unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and your family into your house. If any of them go outside your host into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from you. The oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So they sent them. Off. So she sent them away, and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. By faith, the prostitute Rahab became, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine that this is a uh, this is a special Christmas carol for me. Uh, I grew up in a home where, on the South Shore, Chester Basin, where there was lots of music. My my sister played piano, and my other sister, and my mom and dad, and I sang around the piano quite frequently, often in the evening after dinner. And at Christmas time, there were various carols to sing, but this one I wasn't particularly familiar with. But when I was in Sunday school one morning. After we finished our classes and we came out uh, to be with the adults for the closing of the service, the minister at a Inham Baptist Church in Chester Basin had said, we're looking for three youngsters here who, who will sing uh, We Three Kings. Well, I kind of hid behind someone, I'm sure. <laughs> but my, uh, my older sister stood up and says, Robbie can sing, right? <laughs> So with that, the minister looked at me and said, oh, that's wonderful, Robin. You'll be one of the three kings. Eh? So and a couple of other young folks uh, met a similar fate, so to speak. And so when I was four years old, some 72 years ago, 
by saying in the Baptist Church in Chester Basin with two of my friends, we three kings. So I'm happy to share it with you this morning. Uh, I have to read my, uh, my uh, lyrics a bit because uh, I had some eye surgery this week and uh, I wasn't able to study them, so I'm going to try them. Focus on the family. 
uh, and I hope that this message speaks into your heart. Uh, these are phenomenal women, wouldn't you agree? Uh, just the, the ones that we've done so far. Uh, and uh, it just is incredible uh, as we learn about these women at a time in history and in culture where women were not really recognized at all. And yet, the God of all creation, Jesus Christ, his story envelops women like no one else and treats them far better uh, than anyone has ever done and has transformed them forever. But also gives us, you and I, the understanding of how important it is and how we treat women, treating them with respect and honor and uh, uh, gratitude, too, for all that they do. Uh, I think it's been in the church that, that uh, I have learned uh, to, to be respectful. Not that I do it all the time, but I'm learning to, uh, again to, uh, to do that, and to be thankful. John Gardner has written, we are faced with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised in insoluble problems. What disguised opportunities do you face today? Some have trusted Christ as Savior, but have the disguised opportunity of some besetting sin that keeps bringing them down. How many people know what I'm talking about? Uh, we're always aware of those shortcomings of ours. Probably one of the biggest ones for me is being critical of others. I'm always reminded of that, and brought, and brought, and I said, God, I'm going to do better next time, only to do the same thing over and over again. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, uh, the promise, uh, uh, of course, like me, is that they promise they won't do it again, only to repeat and fail. And some are engulfed in, obviously, problems of marriage, others with their kids. They don't see any viable solutions. Some are struggling daily with serious health problems or personal problems. Some people face problems at work. Others wish they had worked so that they could have problems. Uh, some have drifted into worldliness and spiritual apathy, but they don't even realize they have a problem. Churches have problems too, which are a conglomerate of all the problems of all the members. Because we're not perfect, if we come broken and wounded, we have the tendency to wound other people as well, even within congregations. And uh, it's just part of our human condition. As leader in Israel after Moses' death, Joseph had a pile of disguised opportunities. He had to lead this small little nation of refugee slaves out of 40 years in the wilderness across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land that happened to be filled with evil, violent giants. And the first disguised opportunity was to conquer the fortified city of Jericho. God gave Joshua the plan for victory. By faith, the walls of that fortress crumbled. But that's only part of the story, and I'm going to be sharing that a little bit on the 27th of December. But this is the story I want to share today. Not only does God conquer our powerful enemies by faith, but this is the one I want to speak today on. God converts hopeless sinners by faith. Rahab's story is a wonderful exhibit of God's incredible grace, not only to her, but to us. Number one, Rahab was an unlikely candidate for salvation. Here's why. Because from a Jewish perspective, she had at least had three strikes against her. She was a woman, she was a Canaanite, and she was a prostitute. And the story of Rahab is the second woman mentioned in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. And she has been compared, believe this, to Mata Hari. I wasn't quite sure I knew who that was, so I looked her up. Manahari is the archetype of the seductive female spy. And she first came to Paris in 1905 and found fame as a performer of Asian-inspired dances. And she soon became, began touring all over Europe, telling the story of how she was born in a sacred Indian temple and taught ancient dances by a priestess who gave her the name 
Matahari, meaning eye of the day. In reality, though, Matahari was born in a small town in northern Holland in 1876, and her real name was Margarita Gertrude Zell. And she acquired her superficial knowledge of Indian and Japanese dances when she lived for several years in Malaysia with her former husband. And regardless of her, uh, of her authenticity, she could pack a dance hall and opera houses from Russia to France, mostly because she so her show consisted of her slowly stripping nude. I don't know if I should have been sharing that. But I want you to get the flavor of who Rahab was and how disgusting that might have been. She became a famous prostitute, and with the outbreak of World War I, her catalog of lovers began to include high-ranking military officers of various nationalities. And in February 1917, French authorities arrested her for espionage and imprisoned her at Saint Lazare Prison in Paris. A military trial uh, was uh, undertaken and conducted in July, and she was convicted and sentenced to death. And on October 15th of that year, she, uh, she refused a blindfold and was shot to death by a firing squad. That was not hard. Just to give you a sense of who we're talking about, but we. Here's what happens. These spies, the reason for them going to Rahab's house was God's providence. So I looked up providence, careful, benevolent guidance. Not only do we know that God is sovereign because he is creator of the world, although many of his creation try to make themselves God and tell God what to do, but the other side of God is his providence, his careful, benevolent guidance. And even though Rahab was an unlikely candidate for salvation, God's grace had reached down to her. Grace is not getting what you do deserve. The fact that she is called Rahab the harlot, long after her conversion, underscores God's abundant grace toward her and toward us. The spies did not know when they went there that God had a mission far beyond spying out the land. He had a, they had a mission to reach out to a woman. I remember when, uh, you know, when I went to one of the churches that I was called to and I spent uh, 10 years there. As I look back on it, I wonder what difference did I make but as I thought about that, I remember one particular lady, Elizabeth Johnson. She was a black lady that lived in, a, in, a, in the projects in Halifax. And uh, I always remember her saying how thankful she was to me because of, because of me, she came back to the church. She had had heart issues and at 61 years old passed away after I had left. But I'll never forget uh, she became a deacon, and that was such a, a meaningful experience for her. And uh, uh, I, I'll always remember her as an incredible lady uh, who had an opportunity to reconnect with her Creator and experience Jesus, especially as she came to the end of her life. Um, so this lady underscores God's abundant grace and his mission far beyond just spying on the land. And so, Rahab's faith saved her from perishing. God commanded Israel to kill everyone in Jericho. And I know a lot of people can't understand how in the world can a loving God do such terrible things. And uh, how cruel can God be? Especially at the extermination of everyone in Canaan. But here's the thing that we need to know. God had given the Canaanites 400 years to, to fill up their measure of sin in Genesis chapter 15. And for 40 years they had heard how God had delivered Israel from Egypt through the Red Sea. And for several years they had heard how God had defeated the Ammonite kings, Sion and Og, on the other side of the Jordan. And for seven days they had watched Israel march around that city. But this is what happened. They did not repent of their sin. 
Nobody likes to talk about sin today, so let me just define it. Sin is missing the mark, aiming at something, and it goes off target. Second thing is oh, disobedience. It's about don't go in the cookie jar. When mom's gone, you do it anyway. <laughs> right? The other one is iniquity. Absolutely define what has been asked for, what you know to be true, right in their face. That is iniquity. And then it's trespasses. Trespasses is knowingly or unknowingly crossing over a line that you know you're not supposed to or not, are unaware of. That is sin. And so they had heard all of this, but only Rahab was listening. Rahab could have complained that God was unfair to judge her city. She no doubt lost many friends in the conquest. But instead she knew that she deserved death for the evil lifestyle. She knew that the Lord God of Israel is this. This is what she said. This was her confession. God in heaven above, uh, the God of Israel is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Would you think that that would be a wise thing for the nations of our world to realize today? Canada has left the God that founded, that, that they founded this country on. We are in deep trouble. And so their fear did not lead to repentance. Rahab's fear led her to turn from her sin and to believe in the God of Israel. And by faith she did not perish along with those who were disobedient. Hebrews 11.31 says. Remember what I said sin was? Disobedience, missing the mark, iniquity, trespass. Many think probably correctly that Rahab had come to faith in God before the spies arrived at her house. Mm -hmm. When God providentially brought the spies to her house, she saw it as the means of deliverance for herself and her family. I guess probably like evangelism, the message goes out. It's whether or not people respond. She took the opportunity. And although she did not understand much theology, she had enough faith in the one true God who could save her. Her past life of sin did not disqualify her from salvation because God delights to save notorious sinners for his glory. Number three, Rahab's faith separated her from her disobedient contemporaries. Those who perished are called disobedient. They were not basically good people. This was a terrible nation. They had many gods. They, they sacrificed children. Uh, I'm sure if we had seen it in that day and, and got back, it would have been horrible. They, but they had heard of God's power, but they had refused to submit to him. How many people today? Do you know that Christianity has now been redefined? When people think of Christian, they think of bigots, racists, uh, misogynists, homophobics, that is how they see us today. That is how we're defined. Not that that's right. So people had no interest. But we are to live in such a way that that definition, when people see us, say, that does it is not them at all. To be saved, Rahab had to break away from her people, her culture, and her source of income. And although that is never easy, and she must have wrestled with that kind of decision, by faith she made the break. And we are, told, we are not told whether she warned her fellow citizens or tried to tell them of what was coming and the judgment that was to follow, or whether they mocked her for holding up in her house while Israel's army came through. Saving faith means making a distinct break from this evil world. As Christians, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. It is to be different. And it sometimes means being misunderstood. Number four, Rahab's faith was an obedient faith. In James chapter 2, verse 25, it says, Rahab, next to Abraham, was one who ju was justified by works. 
Now, James is not denying justification by faith alone, but what he is trying to say that faith with O works is dead. Her faith led her to hide the spies and to send them away secretly, even though it put her life at a great risk. And she had to obey the, the explicit instructions that her spies gave her to put the scarlet rope down the outside, the outside window of, of that wall in the city. And she, and she had to have her family inside her home in order for them to fulfill the order, in order for them to be saved. It may have seemed silly to them to watch Israel marching silently around the city for 13 times. What are they doing? What a bunch of idiots. The walls were very thick. How were they ever going to get through? They may even have been tempted to join the others on the wall, shouting down to the Israelites, insulting the troops below. But Rahab and her family didn't do any of that. And they were saved. One of the things I know for sure is that Rahab's faith was not perfect, but she was obedient. She was a, a pagan woman who lived in a culture that she was steeped in and, and, it, and that she knew. And when that king's message came to her, she did lie. But what we're focusing is on is on her obedience and, and God's grace in regard to that obedient faith. As she welcomed the spies, as she hid them, and as she allowed them to escape. If you will come to Christ in faith, just as you are, He saves you and then begins to work His holiness into your life. We accept people not because they're perfect, but because they are wounded and need to be loved, to be healed, for, and to be forgiven. So many people have been kept outside of the church because of a set of values that we basically excluded them rather than making including them and allowing them to see and experience the love of God and to embrace Him because we embrace them. Rahab's faith resulted in the salvation of her pagan family. We do not know for certain that her family was saved spiritually, but we certainly know they were saved from being destroyed uh, when Jericho fell. But we do know that they were saved physically, that, that not only from the physical destruction, but then probably became people of faith because they would live for the rest of their lives in, in Israel. And presumably they came to know that true God. Because to be part of God's family was to be part of community. Much like I think we share in this community and some of the gifts and abilities that we're all sharing together to make this experience such a wonderful experience today. God can use the salvation of unlikely people to transform the lives of other people. Rahab's faith brought her into covenant with God and his people. In other words, to make a promise, just like the covenant of marriage is a binding relationship. She came into that covenant uh, with God and his people. A gentleman by the name of John James Boyce wrote Joshua, we will serve the Lord. He points out that Rahab actually became more Jewish than many of the Jews by birth, and that she believed God, whereas they did not. Matthew Henry in his commentary says, a true believer is desirous not only to be in covenant with God, but in communion with the people of God, and is willing to cast in their lot with them and to fare as they fare. That's what it is to be part of the body of Christ. That's what it is to be in community, is to be part of a fellowship that cares for, supports, and loves others, much like what I experience being here with you. And it includes the surprising fact that Rahab, get this, this is so cool, Rahab married a Jewish man. His name was Salmon. And they had a son named Boaz. This absolutely blows me away because you have to understand that Jews were, 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 were repulsed by the Canaanites, by the Gentiles. What was Rahab? She was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite. She was a woman and she was a prostitute. She had three strikes against her. They would be repulsed by her. 
But God, in his incredible wisdom, his incredible grace, takes this woman, three strikes against her, allows her to marry sin, and gives birth to Boaz, and sets it on the, tra on the, tra the trajectory of being part of Jesus' genealogy. The Son of God. If he can take somebody like Rahab and transform her, how much more can he do in the lives of each one of us and those we know who need to know this God, this Jesus, this, and this Savior? That is the message that we bring as the, uh, as the people of God, as Christians today, into our world that is so broken and so wounded. And to bring the life that Rahab came to know. And she believed God and it was credited to her as faith, righteousness. And so Rahab's faith changed her life from, fu from futility to fruitfulness. I can tell you right now, prostitution is never glamorous. It is ugly. Men pay to use a woman's body with no regard for her as a person. Prostitutes are never respected for what they do. And when their bodies become too old to be attractive, they are out of work, lonely, and unloved. But that incredible example describes how God reclaims the lives of the worst of sinners who turn to him in repentance and faith. And Rahab married and became a mother and a grandmother, and she became partaker of Israel's spiritual privileges, and even became linked to Christ himself. Any life outside of Christ is futile, headed for eternal destruction. You know, it's kind of like, you know, a bridge is out, and you run, and you're telling people, the bridge is out, don't go, don't go, don't go, and they still go anyway. God never sends anybody to hell. We do it all by ourselves by failing to embrace the Savior who has come to rescue us. Jericho, you see, is a picture of this evil world opposed to God. Either you are by faith on God's side with some Jerichos in your life. And I can tell you I've got Jerichos in my life that I'm working on and I need to conquer. I'm sure you do. Or are you simply comfortable living out your everyday experience without him? Thinking that you are safe, just like those in Jericho thought with the thick walls, whether you realize it or not. Wherever you find yourself, the key of victory ultimately is faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his death on the cross and in his resurrection. And that as he delivered us from sin and death, he will deliver us into eternal life. If you are in God's family, faith in his mighty power will give you victory over every intimidating enemy that you face. Any enemy that seeks to destroy you. And the most unlikely person, a Canaanite harlot, becomes a woman who exemplifies genuine faith. And that is absolutely the wonder of the Christmas story. It blows me away. And the nature of genuine faith. So our faith in this Christmas story is not revealed by the singing of our carols or putting up a nativity scene in the front yard. Faith involves our confession and acts of obedience as we approach this holy day Asking God to give each one of us opportunities to reveal that faith in tangible ways for others to see. To see Jesus in you and me. To verbally confess our faith to others. So what great opportunities are disguised in insoluble problems in your life and mine? God has whatever resources that you and I need overcome them. All we simply have to do is trust Him. Trust Him. Amen.
just pray that God is speaking into all of our lives and that if we have not, like Rahab, embraced that faith by confessing Him as Lord and believing Him, that before you leave today, that you talk to us or simply say, Jesus, I want to embrace you like Rahab did so long ago. And believe that you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in my life. That I might have life and be set free. Amen. Our closing hymn is Silent Night, and I'm going to ask you to turn your candles on as. Have a great week.